will have you take their place. That amendment was sponsored, as you know, in the House and the Senate, and will, I guess, soon be going around for ratification in the same manner as the original Bill of Rights. The Second Amendment will pass by very quickly. There's only one organization in America that lives and dies by the Second Amendment, and that's the National Rifle Association. It's on their stationery. They only put half the amendment on the stationery, half on their headquarters in Virginia, and they leave out the militia part entirely because they know how the interpretation since the Miller case has been in the Supreme Court, that the right to bear arms refers to a well-regulated militia. The Third Amendment, I don't think anyone here knows anything about or has had a case about, that's to do with the quartering of troops. This was something the British used to do pretty regularly, I guess. We haven't had it for a while, the quartering of troops in private homes. So I guess the Third Amendment is really a useless one at this moment. But the Fourth Amendment, by which we all here live and die, that is in grave danger, as you know. The cutting down of the exclusionary rule began, of course, with the idea that even if the warrant was faulty, if the constable in good faith believed it wasn't faulty, then the evidence got in. The exclusionary rule did not apply. The so-called good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. Now, in the contract with America, you don't even need the warrant anymore. The language, and I quoted it because it was kind of interesting, that the exclusionary rule will not apply if the officer, without a warrant, conducts a search under the, quote, objectively reasonable belief that it was in accordance with Fourth Amendment, with the Fourth Amendment, even if no search warrant existed. That's going to be the new standard if that ever gets through. But they've broken it down so many other ways. When I was in law school, you couldn't hold suspects 48 hours without a warrant. Now, of course, you can. We didn't have warrantless searches of clothes bags and cars. Now we do. Justice O'Connor ruled in one case that you can ask people in public transportation if they want to be searched, and that was all right because they could always refuse. But you know, you have standing next to you that man that appears in the Western Union money orders, the cop with the sunglasses, big, brawny, Mr. I'd like to search your bag. And you know very few people are going to say no to that. And I guess if they say no, that's probable cause to search. Uh, random drug testing, federal employees, searches abroad of non-citizens by U.S. agents, all has been authorized. So the Fourth Amendment, which really was the gem of the Bill of Rights, because the thing they feared the most, these colonials, were the writs of assistance, the open-ended general writs signed by the king, which existed as long as he lived. And all you did is fill in the names when you wanted to use them. They were challenged, as you know, by James Otis in that famous case in Boston, which he lost. Uh, but the colonists were smarting over these break-ins into their homes, warehouses, ships, meeting halls. So the Fourth Amendment was a very important one. And now it's being destroyed piecemeal, either by acts of legislatures or by the Supreme Court. The Fifth Amendment has long gone by the board. Police now can mislead a suspect as to his right to assign counsel during questioning. They execute defendants with IQs, 55 to 63, mental age of six and a half. 16 and 17 year olds, okay. They're now working on, on 15 year olds and 14 year olds to be executed. With those IQ 55 to 63 or mental age of six and a half, 
It's like the British used to execute mules who kicked their masters. I guess on the theory that the other mules would get the idea not to raise those hind hooves against their masters. Well, that's what we do when we execute people like that. And as you remember, our beloved president, when he was governor of Arkansas, flew back to make sure that a person like this was executed in Arkansas and that nobody stood in the way of that execution. The police can destroy evidence, even exonerative evidence. The defendant has to show bad faith in order to do something about that. Coerced confessions, now perfectly all right. And as you know, the Justice Department has a nice, interesting little adage that federal prosecutors are not bound by ethical rules of the states in which they practice, but only by the Attorney General's rules and regulations. So they've taken prosecutorial misconduct out of the realm of any state ethical rules. Victims are allowed to testify in death penalty sentencing phases as to the impact upon them, but they refuse to allow a victim's family to testify on behalf of a defendant during such a, a phase. Habeas corpus is, as you know, so badly damaged, federal habeas corpus, that it virtually doesn't exist in so many areas. You have a new rule concept. Uh, you have the aspect that if the state says no new evidence after a certain period of time, that that will govern and control federal habeas. I just finished a case in Texas, a man named Bobby Drew, who was executed about four months ago. Bobby was sentenced to death for the murder of a driver of an automobile in which he hitched a ride, young 16, 17-year-old boy from Alabama. Uh, Bobby was on his way from Vermont to Texas to work for his uncle. After he was convicted, the real murderer confessed, said he did it. Bobby was too chicken to get out of the car. A witness who had testified that he had seen Bobby near the body recanted and reiterated testimony that had been taken from him on a tape recorder, an interview, in which he said the same thing. But because the information came more than 30 days, after Texas rule that 30 days after judgment of conviction no more new evidence can be produced and so Bobby was put to death. Uh, many of you know the story of Herrera. Uh, Herrera was sentenced to death for the killing of two police officers in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas years after the murders, years after his conviction. The son of the real murderer came forward and said he had been in the car when his father shot the two police officers. The lawyer for that man came forward, the man was dead, came forward and said he could now speak that that man had confessed to him that he had indeed shot the two officers more than 30 days after the conviction. That's the case in which the Supreme Court said innocence is irrelevant in these habeas corpus cases and Herrera was executed by lethal injection in what's called the Walls in Huntsville, Texas. They have the inexcusable neg neglect concept. You don't raise it in your first habeas. You can't raise it in your second, even though it came to you after the completion of the first habeas. And you have that shriek of anguish by Justice Marshall saying, our court now has, is conducting an unjustifiable assault on the great writ. Procedural defaults in state court proceedings knock out federal habeas. Uh, it's a situation where federal habeas, if you have any access to it at all, is in such jeopardy that it's as if it doesn't really exist. We try, but so many obstacles have been erected to federal habeas, and as you know, 
uh, under the contract with America, it's even limited further. Federal habeas must be resorted to, I think there's a time limit of one year in the contract of America. And they have knocked out funds for capital defendants to procure their writs of habeas corpus and prosecute them. Uh, whereas they are now giving more money under the contract to state prosecutors to defend against the use of federal writs of habeas corpus. So the writ, which I thought was the great writ, that was the name given to it, uh, has now become the late writ. And I think that it's going to have a powerful impact on the practice of criminal law.